Okay. Uh, one thing I asked not be done was to classify me as a scholar. Uh, I, I'm not a scholar. I, I, I think I may be an observer, but I have an interest, a, a long-term interest, in, in Southern ceramics. Uh, my history... is not good with this. <laughs> yeah, please. Oh, we have the little... Okay, okay. Yes, Thank you. Thank you very much. I was at Master years ago. Uh, in fact, it was 1966. And I was in the Army, and my, I had read a book called Knowing, Collecting, and Restoring American Furniture. And I was very interested in the authenticity of furniture. So my wife and I went on vacation. We went up into Richmond, and our intent was to buy one piece of American furniture. Uh, we bought a piece. We bought a chair that cost $135, which was a good part of an army salary at that time. Uh, as we were coming back home, we went through a little town called South Hill, Virginia, and there was a, a pretty knowledgeable dealer there. And so we stopped to see what she had had. It was almost dusk, and she looked at the back side of the uh, station wagon, and she said, uh, I'll give you $50 for that chair. And I said, well, we, we paid 135 for it. And she said, well, son, that's a fake, and you got taken. So after a year of studying and everything, I was kind of devastated, and we had to come back through Winston-Salem or close to it. And I said, Joyce, you know there's a man there in Winston-Salem that's an expert in American furniture. Why don't we call him and, and ask him to look at it? So about 9.30 that night, I stopped at a phone booth, and we found the name of this man. His name was Frank Horton. So we asked if we could come over to his house. He was not delighted. He was courteous. But it wasn't, yeah, come on right now. I can't wait to see you. So we walked up his steps. He opened the door. He spun the chair around on one leg, and he said, 1785, New Jersey, the medial stretcher is replaced. You probably shouldn't be collecting this. So we didn't pay much attention, but we did look to other things that we were interested in. And it just happens we have an, a, an edge field piece sitting on top of the table, and here's the reverse side of it. So basically, I went back home and I knew I was out of the Edgefield area, and I knew there wasn't much to collect. But at that time, I went over to a, a friend's house in, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and he had Mark Casey prints, and he took me by a friend's house, Mr. Charles Genlat. And when I saw the in interior of the house, it was covered with greenish gray decorated, figurated pottery. So. I said, you know, I'm out of the loop. I, I wish I had some access to this, but I didn't. And he introduced me to a friend named Howard Smith, who's now deceased. And Howard says, you've got alcohol-glazed pottery in your area. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, I would look in North Alabama, and I'd look in Randolph County, uh, Alabama. So I began to, to drive the roads. And I just drive down the roads, and I would find absolutely nothing. And finally, I got a Civil War area map, and I began to drive the roads that parallel the early roads of, of 18, well, after 1860, actually, the roads continued. And I began to find something, but our two biggest areas that I have been most interested in have been the uh, Sand Mountain area in northern Alabama and also Randolph County. I'm closer to, the, to uh, Sand Mountain. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that before I get into Edgefield face vessels. We were able to collect some pieces early because there weren't very many pieces being collected at that time. And I contend that these pieces from South Carolina 
uh, actually compete with some of the best edge fuel vessels in form and glaze and, and manufacturing. Uh, the one on the right is a double dip sand mountain. Uh, I'm going to call it a harvest jug. We've always called them monkey jugs. But I think monkey jugs specifically refer to uh, pieces of vessels that aren't completely glazed so that water can evaporate and cool. And these are completely glazed. This is a piece also from Sand Mountain. It's, it's a small jar that's, that's figurated with, with an a architectural feature around the middle plus a lot of bands and sine waves. This is a, a combination of pieces. Uh, a small McPherson uh, picture on the, in the foreground that's about 1880. And then we have a living and complete compatibility we have a piece of Edgefield pottery that has been sub rosa for probably 40 years. Uh, it's a chicken or game cock or whatever you want to call it, but it's probably of the, of the Rhodes manufacturer. I took these last week. Uh, we decorated them out in front of the office for Halloween, and I took some of the larger Sand Mountain vessels. Uh, this is a, a bigger harvest jug, southern harvest jug. It's about five gallons and it's very similar to to the one I showed that was slightly smaller. Another couple or three large vessels. Uh, these are approaching 21 inches and these are about the largest Alabama pieces I know of other than Lehman pieces that were manufactured in Randolph County. So I wanted to get my word in about Alabama pottery because I've, I feel like it's been neglected to a great deal. Uh, what they used to say was, you know, if pottery came, the people in South Carolina or North Carolina didn't know where it was from, uh, or Georgia, they say it was Alabama. Well, we don't know where it's from, we say Texas. And so, I, you know, I don't know if that's changed or not. This is a, a large pitcher. It's about a five gallon pitcher from Randolph County. And it's signed, it has the signature of ZTU for Zachariah Ushery. Uh, a few years ago, Arthur and Esther uh, Goldberg came to visit me and they wanted to see some of our Alabama pottery. So we took it off the shelves and we just stacked it around the bedroom where they could walk in there, and I have a, you know, I have a predilection for larger pieces whenever I can get them, but these are just typical pieces of Alabama pottery, mostly Sand Mountain. This was my first significant collection of, of, of piece that I acquired. Um, this was made by a man named Marvin McPherson, and it's a turpentine jug. It is not a harvest jug. It's a turpentine jug. It's the only Alabama piece that I'm aware of that's decorated with glass slip, with, with melted glass. The reason I know it's a, a turpentine jug is because the Mr. McPherson I bought it from said, Marvin, his grandfather made it, and it was this turpentine jug. <laughs> uh, it was interesting how I got that piece. I begged for it, and you didn't want to sell it. And then about... Two years later, his grandson came and he said, Granddad wants to paint the house and he'll, he'll sell that piece of pottery to you. I had no idea how much it cost to paint a house and I said, okay. But it, it was $800. So long term, you know, it was, it was a lot at that time, but long term, I think it worked out good. Uh, Sand Mountain is known for the double dipped uh, use of two alkaline glazes. Uh, they are, I think, magnificent pieces. This, this is about a five gallon jug. And uh, it, was, it was made by uh, one of the potters up there. This is a group of the double dip pieces. These date about 1880. This was a little sugar bowl made probably in Randolph County. This was my first face vessel. Uh, it's either Alabama Coastal or Mississippi Coastal. I don't, I don't know. Uh, there were a group of potters named Adams there that uh, made uh, salt glaze, and this is compatible with one of the other known examples. And this is just a very small jug, about uh, four inches tall. It's figurated that 
a lady knew that I wanted for years, and she left it in her will for me, really. About 1999, I was walking through the airport in Charlotte, and I saw a uh, veranda today, a veranda magazine, and I picked it up, and there was an article inside it about Southern pottery. And it was an article about pieces that had been in Tony Shank's collection. And Tony Shanks was one of the first and best collectors of Edgefield pottery. He did so much for the whole field by preserving it. And when he sold his collection, he, he delegated it to uh, Deanne Levinson to, to disperse with it. And so she had this article printed and uh, I read that and I'd known Deanne for a long time. Uh, I say that she's one of the only women that can pick up a slant front desk, move it across the room by herself and look good while she's doing it. And uh, she, she's, always been a, a, she's always been very, very helpful to me. I'm going back on her. At that time, when some of Tony's pieces became available, this was not one of his pieces. But that did at least introduce me into an area that I could know more about what was happening to Edgefield pieces. And I was able to acquire some nice pieces. Uh, this is a, a large two-colored Chandler Maker uh, jar. Uh, there aren't very many with, with two colors that are, that are signed. This is a large... Uh, water cooler. It's about 10 gallons. It's dated 1852. Uh, at one time that was in Frank Horton's collection or the collection of, of uh, Mazda Foundation. I, I don't know which, but it too is stamped uh, Chandler Maker. And I was able to acquire some other Edgefield pieces, uh, notably these four four-handle jars. Uh, the one on the top left is a uh, Phoenix factory, it's stamped. Uh, the one on the right, I think that's, I can't see really from here. That's a signed Chandler and script piece. The one on the far left, lower left, is another Phoenix factory. And the one on the lower right is a trap and Chandler. We can look at the stamps here and uh, and, and I'm lucky to have been able to acquire these over a period of time. This is one piece that I bought from Tony's collection. Uh, this was the last poem that, that he had, and it happens to be the first Dave signed piece. And it's the first Dave signed poem. There were poems previous to 1840, but this was the first time he had L. Miles Dave uh, on, on the vessel. The poem on the other side is, Ladies and gentlemen, choose, make all you can, and you'll never lose. Now, that didn't seem very profound to me. I, I couldn't understand it because there were so many uh, verses like, Where have all my friends gone? And, and things with the religious content and, and really profound meanings. And this didn't seem too, too terribly important until about two or three years ago, Rick Green asked me to come over and look at some things that he had brought up from his Stony Bluff site. And in one corner, he had about two bushels of leather soles, soles to, that were placed in the bottom of boots or shoes. And it made me realize that they had an L. Miles, Lewis Miles had a tannery at that site, as well as a sawmill and a lot of other, other businesses. So this is more of a remark upon the culture, the everyday life, than, than some of the other things that he may have ins inscribed. But I think because I can relate it to what was going on right there in, in his location, that it has a lot more meaning to me than it did at first. I'm going to read something real quickly. Uh, there have been a couple of people that have been my mentors. Uh, there's one I'm going to mention in a minute that's been more than the other. But Michael Hall was the first person that I knew that was in the art world, an art his, uh, historian, 
uh, a curator, a sculptor, that actually encouraged me in, in what I was doing. But in 1966, he wrote, at one time or another, almost everyone encounters something in life that brings them up short, something peculiar and enigmatic, enough to trigger the response we call wonder. Such was my response when I first confronted an American face jug. The sculptor, the potter, the historian, and the collector in me were all transfixed by the odd little object which led out from his case display case in a museum. This was in the summer of 1966. Since then, I've handled and documented almost 200 face jugs, and my fascination with, with them has only grown. Now, what, David, what uh, Michael encouraged me in was I took a project to him that I had been interested in face jugs for, for some, some time. Uh, I had seen articles, I'd seen pieces that appeared in Main Antique Digest. Uh, this, this top jug on the right is, is now in the Mariner Collection. It disappeared from me for years and then it popped up about two years ago and I said, aha, I know that fellow. Uh, there was always Billy Joe, Billy Ray Hussey, uh, who you could depend upon to have a face jug occasionally. Uh, there were country auctions, and there were a few articles that were written about them, not a lot. The one on the bottom right, I've lost all reference to it. I, I've had to classify those as lost items. As things went on, museums became more and more interested in face vessels. Uh, the Gibbs Art Museum uh, produced uh, a small pamphlet, as did the... Uh, uh, McKissick Museum called uh, Carolina Folk. Then the auctions began to, to get more interesting and became bigger auctions. And the dealers became more prominent and, and the advertising became more and more visible. And, and now that's moved on with Crocker Farm doing a regular uh, wonderful auctions, and they've included so much Southern uh, material lately that they have taken a, a place. The 1999 auction with, with John Gordon was a particular landmark. There were probably 10, 11 Edgefield face vessels that were offered there. And John Gordon has an interesting trail through the history of face jug collecting. I began to collect literature. I went back and I got old catalogs, I got old auction catalogs. This one was from Skinner in the early 70s. Uh, you can see where Tony Shank bought, a, bought one piece, one face jug there. Uh, I think he paid $1,300 to $1,400 for it. There were two others. They were bought by New York dealers and they, they paid a little bit more than Tony did and as soon as he found out that these vessels you know, they were there, and he thought better about his bids, and he went and immediately bought the other two vessels before the auction, before they left the auction house. So what I've done, basically, is I have felt like, I began to notice that the country auctions and auctioneers would say, this is one of five vessels. There were only eight of these made. And then three years later, I may have seen two or three more, and they'd say there were only five of these made. So I began to wonder how many that had been made, and I began to try to collect all the pictures that I could possibly, possibly collect. And I went back through periodicals, I went back to a Barber's book, I went to auction catalogs, I went to Main Antique Digest, I went to dealers, I went, went to collectors. Now, I said I had another mentor, and that other mentor was Phil Wingard. I've never known anybody that will talk and talk and talk for two hours of the phone about a piece of pottery. Uh, he has an amazing ability to not only remember and recognize, but also to classify things that he's seen. He's not a trained archeologist, but that's been his avocation for a long time. And he's able to combine the archeology span with the form and with what he knows about what came from which site over a period of about 35 years of collecting, being a dealer, and being a, being a scholar. So my, 
my hat goes off very much to Phil. So what do we know about these? We, we can identify the period which I'm talking about. We can accumulate data, and that's what I basically tried to do. I, I really can't interpret the data. Uh, I've just got pictures of a lot of face jugs from a lot of different angles because I think it's good to have that, just like Hadley Chest were classified, so that, you know, if, if that, there was a, a history of, of the Hadley Chest that had been made, I wanted to have a history of face vessels that we felt like were, were legitimate and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we can identify the known sites and we can compare features. Now, the dates that I selected have been 1840 to 1880. And, you know, we can say 1837 or we can say 1882, 18, something like that. But it's, it's from the beginning of, of the first fragments that we found to pretty much the end of the production at, at Miles Mill. Okay, what forms are there? We have jugs. We have harvest jugs, which people call monkey jugs. We have cups, we have pitchers, and we have other. Right now, I have to look at my glasses. Right now, as of, as of last Monday, we had I had 159 documented by pictures. As of yesterday, I had 161. Uh, I did a recount uh, the night before I came and realized I had left one out. And then yesterday afternoon, uh, Jim Witkowski picked me up at the airport and was bringing me in. And a fellow named Jimmy Allen from, from uh, George Coast called me and he says, John, I've got a, uh, I got a picture for you. And it was of an additional piece of Edgefield face vessel. It was, it was a picture. So we've got 119, is that what it says, jug forms. We have 20 some odd monkey jugs, 10 cups, now eight pitchers, and four other forms. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read that. So my next question, are these of value? I mean, is there perception that, that these are uh, uh, cultural remnants, art, folk art, whatever. And apparently, if we look at the number of museums that have acquired these pieces, we might, we might uh, decide that they are of some value. Uh, most of the leading museums on the eastern coast have pieces, the Smithsonian, the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, McKessick, Charleston, uh, Mazda, uh, almost, and, and smaller museums also. So the next question is, where are these pieces now? Basically, the museums own about 30% of them. Private hands uh, account for 64% or 65, and the figures changed a little bit since last week, and unknown or lost, they're about 6%. So we know they've come up in auctions, we know they've come up from dealers, we know they've come up uh, from private sales, but what's happened lately? Not counting auctions. Uh, this piece sold back uh, in, the, in the spring or, or late, late winter uh, in South Carolina, and it was at a, a country auction, and this is the house that it came from. That was the crowd at the auction, and that was the particular piece that was, that was sold that day. The next piece also came from South Carolina. It was discovered by Carl Steen at the Burroughs Plantation. Carl went downstairs in the basement for some reason, and this piece was sitting there, uh, a harvest jug, a very early harvest jug form. And uh, it was pretty much, they didn't know it was there, and uh, he dusted it off. And you can't see from this picture, but it's one of two without ears. Um, this one I discovered or kind of discovered, in a warehouse in Detroit. Uh, my directions were uh, drive down the street, uh, I'll give you the address, park on my side right next to the door, jump out of the car, lock it, and I'll open the door. So I did. And uh, 
that was the little baluster shaped cup that, that was housed there. Uh, this, this slide is wrong. It says South Carolina on the bottom. It's, it's definitely Connecticut. This was a piece that was shown earlier uh, that was found in the renovation of a house on a river uh, in, uh, off the coast of Connecticut, and it housed two pieces. Uh, one of them is in the Mariner collection, and the other is, in, of course, in a private collection. So things do turn up uh, where you don't often expect them. We have the answer for all the questions. We, we have because I've designated 1837 to 1880 about, so we, we have that, but we don't have a lot of other answers. We have some answers to who made them. Uh, we have a lot of questions about what was their purpose. Uh, everything has been, has been reported as being the purpose. Michael Hall thought they were temperance. Uh, vessels to scare people away from liquors and, and whiskey and, and keep the uh, possibility of a slave uprising by, by planting the idea of, of the devil and avoid this type thing. There's a lot of evidence that they were used as uh, boogeyman type things to keep children out of things that might be harmful to them. Uh, they, were, they were thought to be conjuring jugs. Uh, they were thought to be associated with root medicine. And I will say one thing, that there is controversy, and there has been controversy. I think there's less controversy maybe because of, of meetings like this than there have been previously. But there was a vast difference between the collector's prejudices and the academic uh, lack of sight. Uh, so I think that that's narrowing, and that's just a personal observation. I don't think there's that that combativeness that there is, but three or four years ago there was, when, when everything had to be attributed to the use of conjuring. So I will say that I think there's, there's really good evidence that the face vessel type was introduced by Thomas Chandler. And a lot of this research was, was done by Philip. And he has taken a piece that on the top left that was made uh, in, in Maryland, and probably in Chandler's earlier years before he came south. And if you compare the features of that to the, to the one in the very bottom, I mean, that could not be coincidence. That had to be by the same hands. And if you follow the formation of the spouts, the handles, etc., then there's a progression. This one in the middle is probably, based on archaeological evidence, one of the first pieces that Chandler made in, in the Edgefield District. This one was probably made at Shaw's Creek. It's very similar to the uh, Burroughs Plantation piece. No ears. It's, it's a big piece. It's like 12 inches tall, whereas generally an Edgefield face vessel may be nine and a half uh, inches tall, a, a, a big uh, harvest jug. This is one that turned up in Georgia about two years ago. This one was made at, I'm sorry, this one was made at the Chandler Maker site, and the one on the bottom right is again the Burroughs Plantation piece. So we know that we have archaeological evidence from six different sites. Uh, we can speculate on other sites, we can speculate on BF Landrum, we can speculate on Sigla, we can speculate on a lot of things, but we only have evidence of, of uh, archaeological evidence in Sherds from six different sites. One of the earliest one is Shaw's Creek. Uh, let's jump to John Landrum first, though. Carl Steen, in his excavations at the Landrum site, which closed in 1837 when John Landrum died, of a nose that was found in the content of the pottery itself. It, it wasn't like something that had been dropped on the trail. And the nose was rather distinctive. And we looked at a bunch of noses, and we found one group that we found this particular uh, monkey jug or harvest jug that had a very similar nose. And then we found some others. And I'll go back to that later. Now, I will say that there was a similar nose like this, but the formation of it, the, the shape of it, found at the Bainham sites. Uh, Miles Mill site were different. So 
I feel pretty good that this nose relates to this, this group of face jugs. Uh, Shaw's Creek. Uh, Phil bought today, and we, we can put them on a table here when we finish. He bought some sherds from the Shaw's Creek uh, excavations or that Terry and uh, Stephen Farrell did. And these are probably the, some of the very earliest. Uh, it's big. It's like, what do you think George Washington might look like or something? I, I don't really know. But we don't have any extant examples as far as I know from this site. These, I think, uh, the, the, the shirt on the right was among those that were gathered by Rick Green at Stony Bluff and now is in the good hands of, of the Toussaints, I believe. And this can be matched with probably three or four other face vessels that you could say there's definitely a possible connection with Dave since this was his major site. Okay, let's go to the Thomas Davies site. It has been discussed and discussed and discussed. The standard story is that in 1861, Colonel Thomas Davies was interviewed by Barber and he said that in the spare time, the slaves had plenty of time to make grotesque uh, vessels in their, in their free time. And that has become gospel. I mean, we can't refute that, but that's not true, I don't think. I think it was the most important first book of American ceramics, uh, porcelain, and pottery, but it's just like dentistry is not practiced right now like it was in 1909, or noise medicine, and we've learned a lot more. If we look at some of the things that Davies said, or well, Barbara reported, was that they were coated, they were unglazed, that uh, they were for the evaporation of, of water to keep water cool. And there's not a single Edgefield face, well, there's, there are two, that don't have glazes on. So you can say on the majority of the evidence that that statement by Barbara is probably inaccurate. Also, there's no record of pottery being made at the Davies site from the cash books until 1863. So Barbara is saying that they were made before that. Well, Barbara was a successful, big, rich, educated plantation owner. He had a lot of businesses. And I, I wonder how credible it is that he knew everything that was happening in his pot shop when he was really supplying money and slaves. So that's just a question, and I'm not saying I think that Barbara did a great job, but I don't think that we can date everything and say that everything uh, that originated in Edgefield face vessel vessels originated with the slaves from the Wanderer that came in about 1857, 1858, and by 1861 they were making face jokes. Yes, I think they were making some, and I think it may have reflected their African culture, but Slaves had been in the South since 1800 or before, and they'd been making pottery this long, okay? So did suddenly put pottery face jugs just appear in 1863 or 1861? I think they had to be made before that, and that also gives us credit, credit, uh, credibility to the earlier forms that were made by the, by the Angle uh, and Western European potters, the Chandlerson group. This, these are examples from Miles Mill. Uh, there's some, uh, there was an excellent uh, work that was published in Ceramics in America. Uh, these pictures, I, I think the shards and everything were from that. And there are a lot of pieces of pottery that occurred in Miles Mill. Uh, I think that there may be 40 or so. And I don't even have a current count, but the thing that's always distinguished Miles Mill from other types of other, other sites has been the flat spout. And so if it has a flat spout, uh, it's Miles Mill. I disagree with that. This is a group of, uh, of Miles Mills that are in the apothecary uh, jar shape that later uh, in the early 1890s became the same form that the apothecary jars that were sanctioned by the state of Carolina for, for medicines. Uh, there's another group, and they're a little bit more refined. 
they obviously uh, are different. They have the reel turning of the spout is like the reel or, or on, a, on a chair or a piece of furniture. And they're obviously a little bit different. Are they a different maker? Are they a different, a little bit different time period? And then there are a lot of things that we have to call, they got flat tops, but you're gonna to have to call them atypical Miles Mill because they don't have the earmarks of these other types. They're, they're more formed, they're more molded, they're less manufactured than, than the, the previous ones I showed. And if we think about the flat top that's designated Miles Mill, maybe we're making a mistake Maybe if we go back to the prescription bottle, rim bottles that were pre-Civil War, that we can correlate those to the shape of the flat bottles. And this little guy is only about four and a half to five inches tall. He's basically the same size as, as a poison bottle. And, and maybe this was pre-1865, pre-Miles Mill, about the time of the Civil War. I don't know. Then there's the Thomas Chandler site, and this piece is, is uh, pretty well known. Uh, we're dating it 1852. And so just to look at some of the forms real quickly, I'm gonna start with other forms because there are fewer of them. There's the little, the little uh, two-chambered guy at the top left, then in direct opposition to size, we have the big Dave uh, umbrella stand on the right. Now, there's pretty well good documentation that that was made in Aiken or in the area of Miles Mill. Uh, there was a, a lady there that wrote a letter uh, to the Charleston Museum in about 1923, and she related that at one time she had had an umbrella stand with a face on it and it had been broken, and that there were other examples in the Miles Mill area. Jill Coverman, uh, uh, John Bur Burris, and uh, Tony Shank looked at the construction of, these, of that piece and they pretty well found that it was compatible with the large poems and things that Dave had done on other pieces. And then there's the one that the Augusta Museum has on, on the lower left that is it's not, a, it's not a jug, it's not a jar, it, it's something else. And then there's a molded piece that the Farrells had, which is interesting. I had a hard time for a long time saying that that was a typical Edgefield face jug. And then I, I didn't think, I was discussing it with Phil, and I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, I'm surprised there aren't more of them. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you wanted a face jug for whatever that purpose was, and you didn't have a wheel to turn it on, you might mold it. And why aren't we finding a lot more? So it was molded, it's in the same form and everything as the others, it's very small, and then it was fired like a regular piece of pottery would be. Uh, the John Lee, the Lee piece on the lower right, I don't know where to classify it, it's a figural, it's owned by the Charleston Museum, and I have not included it in, as a typical Edgefield face vessel. So let's look at pictures. We have, that's next to the uh, atypical of the forms, we have more pictures than anything else. We, we had until yesterday, we had seven. Today we have eight, uh, when we add the one that Jimmy Allen told me about. Uh, the very bottom one is, I'm sorry. The very bottom one is a recent addition to the Mariner collection in, in the bottom center. I'm sorry, bottom right. And the others have got some remarkable, I'm so, I'm so very sorry. The others have got some remarkable similarities. Uh, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here, and there's the one that Alan told me about yesterday. They very much resemble the, the glaze and, and the format, the, the color, the clay body, everything from Miles Mill site. So I think that you could extend that and say that that was a possibility. These were Dave-associated pieces. 
cups are next. There are ten cups, and uh, they are in two different forms, basically. There are five baluster-shaped ones with an ovoid uh, shape to them with, with features. You might notice the tooth treatment in them is not the same. Uh, they're incised lines, they are diagonal lines, which uh, might be called the master of the diagonal teeth. Uh, they are examples with no teeth, and yet there's a similarity, and they're molded teeth, that, but yet there's similarities in all these cups. So why in there some, well, why did they change the teeth all the time? I, I don't know. I guess the potters can, can do various things at what they want to. And these are the five examples of the, of the tapered cylindrical cups. If we get to monkey jugs, I want to go to something called the Joe Kirksey group. Now, there are a group of seven, uh, seven different uh, harvest jugs that have similarities. Um, they have the same, basically, the type spout. They have the same treatment of of the brows, of the eyes. One of them, the second one in the top left, is in the High Museum, and it is, is signed Joe Kirksey. So I'm calling these, I'm calling these the Joe Kirksey group. I'm gonna give up on that. I'm calling this the Joe Kirksey group, and I think that there are similarities enough that we could say that these are probably made by the same person. The two on the lower right corner uh, have just turned up, turned up in one collection. Essentially, it's a pair, which is almost unbelievable to me. There's a Chandler-related group. Now, these three have got the uh, same similarities uh, that the spouts, that sort of thing, that, that place them in a group. There's the Joe Banford or Ranford group. And again, this is, is, this is a large group. They have certain identifying features, the cosmetic type eyebrows, uh, the, the way the eyes are placed, the nostrils, uh, just the size, the size is distinctive. And then there are some others. Uh, there's one that's particularly sad and, and plaintive, and it's uh, of two black children that were done, I think, in 1882 in a photographer's shop, and it was when the aesthetic movement was, uh, was high in the U.S. and also in, in Europe. And it was a, apparently these two pictures, uh, that piece was owned by Priya Harmon and Tony Shanks previous to that, but these two pictures were made and they were in parody of a photograph that uh, appeared in Harper's Bazaar and it was called The Aesthetic Monkey. I always get a little sad when, when I see that. These are others. Uh, these are uh, harvest jugs that they've got some resemblances to the others, but they don't fall really into a group. Uh, there's one piece on the lower left that appeared uh, as a drawing in the American uh, Design of American Index of American Design back in the 30s, and the piece next to it turned up in Colorado that looks very much like it, but other renditions of pieces I've seen, they're so close that I don't think that these are the same pieces. So I've included them as two different pieces. There are more mysteries than answers. There's a group that we could call the Skull Maker. Uh, they don't fit these mouth mill pieces. They don't fit the the identification marks of the other sites, and there are a lot of them. There may be 40 pieces out there that just don't quite fit anything. So we've got to think there's, there are other sites. We haven't found all the sites. We, you know, B.F. Landrum made every one of those forms of, uh, of spouts and handles, but he never gave the slaves the latitude. He didn't give Dave the latitude to sign his pieces. He didn't give the, little, the slave woman who hanged herself in his barn any latitude. So to me, it's unlikely that the slaves had the freedom to make these vessels. So I can't rule out B.F. Landrum. I can't rule out another uh, 
uh, Lewis Miles site. I can't rule out some others, but they are, they are mysteries that we, I don't know the answer to. So some of the mysteries are this one, and there are a lot of them. I'm just giving examples. This little guy, he's four and a half inches tall. He has no resemblance to, to any of the others that I've seen. This one is in the uh, New York Historical Society. There's a little similarity between those last two to me. When I started doing this, I, uh, I tried to write down features. Uh, I looked at everything I could. I looked at the type of glaze. I looked at the, the eye treatment. I looked at the noses. I looked at the mustaches. I looked at the teeth. I looked at goatees. I looked at everything that, that I could find and came out totally confused. <laughs> the features that I looked at one of them was alkaline glaze. I think that's the most undependable feature to look at. Uh, the glazes varied so much with the production and, and that sort of thing that I think it's a unifying thing once you pick up some features that are, are real close that you can then look and say, yeah, these also have this same glaze, but I don't think it's the first thing. I think clay body, size, eyebrow treatment, tongue treatment, ear spout, any inscriptions, the mustache, the handle attachments, restorations will fool you. There are some that are restored rather heavily, and there are some fakes, not many that I know of, but restorations will fool you. The handle is not what it was when it was made. Uh, I think this is true in, in the Pofu piece or Pope Squire piece, that there's so much restoration on that piece that you don't know what it was in its originality. Uh, Goatees, things like that are also significant. This is Stony Bluff. Uh, this is the bluff above the pond where Dave turned his, his pottery. Uh, I have a scar on my knee about four inches long. I fell off that bluff and hit a rock. But uh, Now, one feature that I, I alluded to earlier was, was Carl Steen's study where he found this, this particular nose and I projected it further forward to a group of actually 10 face vessels that have a very, very similar nose, aquiline features, perforated nostrils. Some of them are painted, some of them aren't. Uh, that there's one picture and a combination of jug form and uh, harvest form. I'm about to finish in just a minute, but another thing that I'm interested in is, is teeth. And some of the vessels don't have any teeth. And you can make certain combinations. And of those, at least two of them are, are Dave-related. One of them, one other may be. And it's interesting that they don't all have teeth or whatever. Now, the opposite of this are people, uh, are the pieces that have got really, really well-formed teeth. Uh, they are monstrous in, in a way. Uh, they're, they're scary and they're very definite. Uh, we look at the day piece on the lower left and it has, it has uh, these teeth. If we look at it a little bit harder, April Hines told me last, oh, early summer that she had interviewed someone in her studies and he had talked to her about Dave Pottery. She said it came out of the blue and that she had said, he had said, you know, Dave Pottery made his with a little strange looking mustache that came down. So if we look at mustaches, then we look at the one, we look at this one, and it's got a very similar mustache. Is this related or is, is this just coincidence? And, and there are others. Unibrow is interesting. Uh, there are 13 that have basically one eyebrow. And I think that they could very well be related, but on the other hand, there's such dissimilarities. We look at these two pieces, and you look at them and you think they might be cousins or something. The spout is compatible, 
the unibrow, the placement of the eyes, the position of the ears, the nose, the size, and then you've got one with form teeth and you've got one with incised square teeth. So is this just a very variable that the, the potter or the person who was put on the features did? I don't know. So in ending, I think the, the picture's still muddy. I think uh, it's foggy. I don't think we know everything. I, I will remark on one thing that I, I forgot, and, and that's the John Gordon connection to what's going on. Gordon studied at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and he was familiar with, with Barbara's collection. Barbara owned a face vessel, and he was familiar with, with Barbara, even though they weren't there at the same time. Then, later on, Gordon made a connection with a man named Franklin Ferenga. And Franklin Ferenga, I think, was the state archaeologist for Georgia, but he was, I think that's right, but he was stationed in Augusta. And he had an interest in face vessels and in day vessels. They got together, they found a lady named Mrs. Eve, and she told them that she had a collection of face vessels that her son had collected from black homes around Augusta, Aiken, Edgefield, and that area. Michael Hall later went to California and examined Faranga's collection of face vessels, and he said, he said there was a good number. I got the idea of seven or eight, and he told him everything he knew about each one of them. Faranga and his wife became friends with John Gordon, and they would go, the Faranga's would go to New York, and they'd go to the theater together, uh, Mrs. Gordon told me that, that uh, John, her husband, went down to uh, Augusta at one time and met with Faringa. And I think that a number of these vessels that appeared in the Gordon collection, in the Gordon sale, were probably these pieces that came out of the Eve collection and came out from John, from Franklin Faringa. I think there's still an undertone of John Gordon in some of the pieces that are being offered for sale at this time. I don't exactly know what it is, but I think there's a warm trail there. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time in letting me do this. <laughs>